The Coin Week podcast is brought to you by PCGS. Before Sotheby's brought the coin we're going to discuss today to market, they trusted PCGS to grade it. Maybe you should follow suit and trust PCGS to provide its unbiased expert opinions on your numismatic collectibles. Visit www.pcgs.com to become a Collectors Club member today and get eight free grading submissions when you sign up at the Platinum level. You know that the 1933 St. Gowden's Double Eagle is the most notorious coin in the U.S. series, but do you really know the coin that the U.S. Secret Service spent more than 60 years pursuing? We talked to world-renowned numismatist David Tripp about the one coin that the government couldn't keep, next on the Coin Week Podcast. Hi, everybody. This is Charles Morgan, editor of Coin Week. Today, we're lucky to be joined by David Tripp. David is a numismatic writer, researcher, and cataloger who has enjoyed a long relationship with Sotheby's and the coin that we're going to talk about today, the infamous 1933 Double Eagle gold coin. It was a coin that David researched in great detail in preparation for the coin's historic 2002 sale for his award-winning 2004 book titled Illegal Tender, Gold, Greed, and the Mystery of the Lost 1933 Double Eagle, and most recently for its upcoming appearance at Sotheby's sale of three objects from the Stuart Weitzman collection. David knows this coin like no one else and has even served as the government's key witness in a landmark case involving 10 examples of the 1933 Double Eagle that were held in secret by the family of Philadelphia jeweler Israel Swit. Today, we're going to let David tell the story of the 33 in a way that only he can. Hi, David. Thank you so much for coming on to our show. Uh, it's a delight to be here, Charles, and uh, welcome, welcome everybody uh, to what I hope will be a good tale. Well, it's certainly, it's certainly a great tale. Almost reads like a fish tale if it wasn't all true. So the 1933 Double Eagle is probably the most notorious coin in all of numismatics. Why is it so rare? And why did the government care that a few dozen examples of this coin were released into the wild? Uh, that's a lot of questions, simply worded. Uh, why is it so important? Why is it so rare? Well, I mean, if we, if we go back to when it was being produced in the early days of 1933, I think, as we all know, the, the economy was in tatters. We were in what they called the interregnum. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt had been elected president, but had not yet assumed office. And as they were going through this, this period, there we saw the economy hemorrhaging. People lost faith in money. People started to withdraw their money uh, from the banks. And the only thing that seemed to appeal to them was gold. And so there was not only a run on the banks, and banks were failing left, right, and center. Uh, there was no FDIC. There was no protection for investors and depositors. And so they put their faith in gold. Um, and so much gold exited the system that the Federal Reserve Bank, which had to have X amount to back gold currency, um, hit the minimum required by law. And against this backdrop, with 25% of the workforce out of work, 500 banks closing, um, FDR took office and he needed to do something and do it quickly. And he took office on March 4th, 1933. And one of his first acts was to call Congress into special session. Um, and his next act was an executive order, I think it was number 2039, to ban the payout of gold. And so gold on that day, and it's still, uh, it's very interesting. That, to many people, economists, that really marked the end of the gold standard. And as we all know, the government uh, on a political level does one thing and on a practical level does something else. And so even though Roosevelt was banning the payout of gold and starting the recall of gold, the Philadelphia Mint went on doing what it did 
and was striking gold. So these are coins that were legally made, but they were never supposed to be uh, distributed. And that's, that's where it all gets started, and that's where it all gets interesting. 445,500 made, the last one delivered to the cashier on May 19, 1933, but none of them were supposed to be released into the wild. So the second part of your question, why did the government go after them? $20 wasn't a minor thing. It wasn't a dinner at McDonald's. It was, it was a lot of money. People made two or three, if they were lucky, two or three double eagles a week. I mean, if you put it into that, into that context, you realize that it was a, a good sum of money. Um, it was also gold, and gold backed the economy. And so when the government suddenly saw its, its repositories, and got to remember back then there was no Fort Knox yet. Um, so the mints and the assay offices around the country were where the wealth of the nation was stored. And when you discover that you've got gold walking out the door, it's kind of embarrassing. And so that is what launched it all. So a number of 1933 double eagles began to trickle into the market in 1937 and ended up in the hands of some of the period's most prominent numismatists. What was the first clue that any of those involved the distribution or collecting of these coins was out of the ordinary regarding the coin's title? In terms of when did the government find out something was Yes. Up? Uh, well, in 1944, um, Stax had an auction, and it was the, the collection of James Flanagan, Colonel Flanagan, who was reputed to be a friend of, of Roosevelt's and so forth, and it was a fabulous collection. Um, and don't forget, this is only 1944. Stax has only been in business for a decade or so. They're, they're still the young guys on the block, and this was a spectacular collection. And the last lot of the sale, if I am not mistaken, was a 1933 Double Eagle. Uh, which they cataloged being excessively rare. Uh, I think they said only six or eight or eight to ten known. And they even went so far as to say that no unlimited bids would be taken on this coin. And, and for those of us who are of a certain age, we remember that you would take an unlimited bid on certain pieces when you knew the client extremely well, and that meant the sky was the limit. However, they knew this could take off, and they didn't want to be on the hook. In any event, um, a man called uh, Ernest Keeter, who was the stamp and coin editor for the New York Herald Tribune, uh, remember when they still had reporters for newspapers in those categories. But in any event, Keeter, who was primarily a stamp man, and in fact I think is in the Philatelic Hall of Fame, uh, was curious by, by seeing this, this catalog description. And he shot off a note or called the, the, the men and said, you know, is this true? Are there only six to eight of these known? Um, or is this nothing more than, you know, typical coin dealer bombast? Well, it landed on the desk of Leland Howard, who was the assistant director of the Mint, and he started doing some checking. He uh, sent a telegram to the Philadelphia Mint, and asking them to check on this uh, because there was one coming up for sale and he wanted it done post haste. He received a multiple page document from the Philadelphia uh, superintendent's office, which indicated that according to all the records that the Philadelphia Mint had, none of the coins had ever been released. All according to their records were accounted for, two in the Smithsonian and the rest of them uh, officially destroyed. Therefore, what Stax had was either a fake or was it possibly stolen property? And therein started things. Howard went to the Secret Service. Uh, the got to remember back in those days, it was all in the Treasury Building. The Secret Service headquarters were in the same building as the Mint headquarters. So it was just, you know, down the hall, up the stairs, down the stairs. Um, and it was put on the desk of a man called Frank Wilson, who was the chief uh, of the Secret Service. He had cut his teeth um, in the IRS investigation division, and during his time was responsible for putting Al Capone behind bars, which was based on numbers, as we all know. Um, and this is despite the fact that uh, Capone had a 
contract out on Wilson's head. Wilson also uh, was responsible for uh, getting the banknotes used in the Lindbergh baby's kidnapping uh, recorded so that they ultimately were able to capture Bruno Hauptmann, uh, which led him to the electric chair. Anyway, um, Wilson was a pretty remarkable man. Um, he has actually been called by some to be the, the father of forensic accounting, and he took it seriously. And he then uh, assigned a couple of agents to the job, and they went to Stacks, and they, invest, they looked at the coin, and they seized it as potentially stolen property. Stacks could not have been happy, but they immediately put the Secret Service agents on to the name of someone else they knew had a coin, which was a man called Max Berenstein, who was a couple of blocks away. The agents, uh, it was Haley and Strang at this point, marched over there, and Berenstein unhappily surrendered his 1933 double eagle and then rattled off the name of yet more people who had them. So it was kind of like the door was cracked and suddenly everybody, everybody who was involved in it knew. The next day, the Secret Service turned up at Stacks, more names turned up, more interviews were taken, and the investigation started. So if we, if we think of it, it was March 1930, uh, 1944, that the government got wind that, that these coins are out there. They authenticated them almost immediately, and so it was a case of finding out uh, if they were stolen property, who had them, and where had they come from. This led them to Philadelphia, and the investigation continued down there. And it, it cracked open, I would say, pretty fast. They ended up interviewing any number of people from Stephen Nagy to, most remarkably, James McAllister, who was a, uh, a very, very talented. Anybody who has looked at the old Morgan Thaw catalogs of large sense has seen some of his his great cataloging in the early days. And uh, McAllister said very bluntly, yeah, he had them, and he brought five of them, all in 1937, and he brought them all from a guy called Israel Swit, who was an old gold dealer, and that Swit, according to McAllister, had a reputation. McAllister didn't believe all the stories of where Swit said he had got them. Um, and before the end of the year, gave up buying them because he said they were too rare to rep they were too many of them to rep for him to represent Israel. The Secret Service then found Israel Swit uh, in his offices over on Jules Row in Philadelphia and they took a uh, a sworn statement from Swit who indicated that he had first got 1933 double eagles and started selling them in early February 1937. And then he sold five to McAllister, and two to Abe Kossoff, and two to Ira Reed. Now, the thing to remember is that February 1937 coincides exactly with the period that the U.S. Mint tipped the last batch of 1933 double eagles into the crucibles to be melted. They opened, they opened the, the cage in which 445,000 were being sealed during that month. And so there's, there's an interesting coincidence in when they first appeared and when they were supposedly officially destroyed. So that opened it up. And then from Swit was the conduit to McAllister, who was interviewed. He told the, deal, the uh, Secret Service agents to whom he had sold them. They then started tracking it down and effectively created a family tree of where each of the coins had gone. And they interviewed various people, really some of the most eminent collectors of the day. And, you know, Fred Boyd, for example, said, I'm not giving you my coin until you can prove to me that it was stolen. And they, he actually went down to the Treasury Department and met with them personally and kept in touch with them. And so the investigation continued in this manner. And, and ultimately, as it went through the year, uh, the Secret Service came and went, and they determined that SWIT, although SWIT claimed, and the interesting thing about this is that SWIT claimed in his uh, report that he never got the coins from the Mint 
or from any employee or through any employee of the Mint. But he was a regular depositor of the Mint through Old Gold, which was what he did, although he had lost his license for having been found to be smuggling or carrying, we shall say, uh, a bag full of, of gold coins um, and it had to for forfeit them. I think it was $2,000 face value. So his, his gold license was stripped, but his partner Ed Silver uh, continued in the trade. And so he was a regular at the Mint and you knew everybody there. And so the Secret Service simply did what they did. They, they as I said, uh, Frank Wilson was, was a forensics guy. The Secret Service agents went through people's tax returns, Israel Swift's tax returns, his partner's tax returns. They went through uh, McCann's material. McCann, who was the, the former, who appeared to be the conduit, Swift had obtained the coins. And they found an interesting overlay of deposits of $1,000 a month uh, from the Swift silver account and into and, and a simpler pattern of payments into McCann's uh, account. $1,000 a month. Think about that. That's a lot of money. And, you know, McCann was making just shy of $60 a week. So to suddenly um, have an influx of $10,000 in, in income matched and overlay the goals from the Swit account led the agents to the, to the belief that, that the two were inextricably tied. They, McCann, when interviewed, refused to divulge the source of the income. And of course, McCann, by the time they interviewed him in 1944, was no longer a Mint employee, having been uh, arrested for embezzling uncurrent silver coin in 1940. And in 1941, he was convicted and sent to Lewisburg Penitentiary I think it was a year and a day was his sentence. So it, it all started to come together. The, the, the point was that by the end of the year, the Secret Service agents had interviewed a raft of people who had been employees of the Mint uh, during the period. Uh, no one ever said to them these had gone out through normal channels. Um, everybody seemed to want to deflect the responsibility. Uh, McCann's former boss, Ralph Rowland, said that they, the, the 1933 double eagles could not have um, circulated without McCann's knowing about it and having something to do with it because he had the only 1933 double eagles that were under his control. Uh, these probably were in either his safe upstairs or in the cashier's working vault in the basement, which by regulation was the only vault that an individual could work in alone. Uh, by the end of 1945, the Secret Service had essentially tied it up, and they had discussed it with Nellie Taylor Ross, who was the director of the Mint at that point, and the decision was, and she felt that the coins were in illegal circulation, and the Secret Service then uh, put a summary report together, which was sent to the U.S. Attorney, asking if charges could be brought against Swift, Silver, and McCann. Uh, the chargers, the uh, uh, charges were not brought specifically. The statute of limitations had run out. Um, but having said that, the government, having determined that these were stolen, did go after the individuals, the collectors who had them, um, telling them that they were in possession of stolen property. And they could have had two choices. A uh, Secret Service agent would come and collect it or they could be prosecuted for knowingly owning stolen property. So uh, under, the, under the collectors themselves, you know, the, the ones who are initially interviewed, in, in your research, did you ever turn up anything that gave you an indication whether they knew before they were interviewed by the Secret Service that there might be something illicit about these coins or maybe the, the title wasn't so cut and dry? I mean, do you have any evidence that McAllister or Abe Kossoff or any of these guys had any idea that these coins may be problematic? Um, I, I didn't. Uh, in terms of the dealers, it's hard to say. I mean, uh, McAllister, I think, shall we say, jumping ship when he found out how many were potentially out there. Um, I mean, he was on record with the Secret Service 
and saying that Swit or, or his partner Ed Silver said that we had 25, only saw 14. Um, and by the end of 1937, McAllister had, had, had left the dock and wasn't buying anymore, as I said. Don't forget, you know, wholesale price on these coins was $500. That is a pile of money for a four-year-old coin. And we realize that we're in the depths of the Depression. And, you know, McAllister bought the first one for $500 and sold it the next day for $1,600. Um, he then immediately went back to Swift, bought the second one for $500, and sold that to Fred Boyd um, with two 1933 Eagles, all from the same source. So, <laughs> and, he, and he gets to upgrade a set of wheels in the process of dealing with this coin. <laughs> So, so, so McAllister, I, I get the feeling was uncomfortable uh, at that point and got off it. Uh, Kossoff initially, you know, Swit had said that Kossoff had bought two. Kossoff, when he was interviewed by the Secret Service, said, well, he'd only sold one, but he'd sold it twice. And then later in life, in the 80s, when he wrote one of his columns, he indicated that he had bought a four. He was clearly aware that the Secret Service was investigating, and yet, in the same breath, knowing that the Secret Service was already seizing 1933 double eagles as potentially stolen property, he blithely sold one for a thousand bucks to Louis Eliasberg. So had the Secret Service ever investigated a case like the 1933, like the stolen 1933 double eagles before? Was there any kind of procedure for how to approach an issue like this? There was constant pilfering from the Mint. I mean, that, that, that's gone on for years. There was another investigation a few years earlier to an entire bag of 1928 double eagles missing. Um, and I think also from further research I've done in, in to, to, to Wilson in particular, who's a fascinating guy, to really tighten things up. And because he was, I think, at heart, an accountant, he, he really took the forensic attitude to a different degree. And the thing is that, you know, the, the case number was CO10468. Well, CO means chief's office. It means that this particular investigation was being led by Wilson himself. So somehow in the uh, fog of all of this, uh, uh, almost serendipitously, I guess, uh, the fruit coin somehow evades scrutiny when it's presented to the State Department by an agent of the Egyptian government who's looking for an export license. In your book, you suggest that uh, this may have been a case of one hand of the government bureaucracy not being aware of what the other hand is doing, although I think the investigation into the coin was probably in its like nascent period at this point. But how is it, and this is the thing that I wonder about, you know, when, in regards to the 2002 sale and the case uh, surrounding that, how is it that the decision the State Department made to authorize the export of this coin without knowing anything about its title, uh, how is it that this precedent held up as definitive proof that the coin could be legally held? It, this is where timing is everything. This was about or three weeks before the investigation even began. Secondly, it was not the State Department that signed off. It was, in fact, the Treasury itself. The laws at that period demanded that any gold coins being sent out of the country had to have a license. Uh, TGL uh, 170, uh, Treasury Gold License. And so the representative of the government took the coin to the treasury to make sure it ticked off all the boxes and got it a, uh, a license. Um, it was taken to a lot who was then at the Smithsonian and one of the boxes basically said this that was this coin rare and unusual prior to April 5, 1933. Now it's pretty hard for something to be rare and unusual uh, while it is still in production, uh, particularly in the hundreds of thousands. So a lot erroneously signed off on that basis, and he was, it 
de was determined later, unaware that none of the 1933 double eagles had even been issued. So what happened is, sales took place before the stack sale. It received its license and in all likelihood was either on its way out of the country before the Secret Service investigation even began. The Treasury Department did get in touch with State Department. State Department effectively pulled the whole thing saying, you know, let's, this is World War II we're in the middle of. The Suez Canal was a, incredibly important to the Allies, uh, not to mention that you know, the entire North Africa campaign was going on. For, it was a linchpin uh, politically. And, you know, to the State Department, regardless of what the Treasury Department might think, uh, a $20 gold piece was not high on their radar. But yet this export license holds up as a as a key as a key issue in the argument that the coin was legally held. Well, here this is I think, you know, the, the point was the United States government did issue the license. One of the arguments that the when the first series of, when the first litigation was going on over Steve Fenton the, the existence of the license turned up, that was one of the government's arguments. Simply having an export license for something that was stolen, but not discovered to have been stolen, didn't necessarily make it legal in any event, and there are all sorts of analogies they gave. Uh, the problem is, as it was explained to me, as a difficult thing for a jury to wrap its head around. And it may have had something to do with the reason there was ultimately a settlement. You know, not not explicitly mentioned in your book, or at least not not completely spelled out. It's alluded to, uh, but there was very strong evidence to support the idea that mega collector Ted Naskers, no longer with us, uh, owned not one. Uh, but possibly four examples of the 1933 double eagle. And this would have been at the time that the Farouk coin would have still been in hiding either in Europe or, or, or Africa, wherever it was. Um, and you show a photo in the book uh, of, a, of a 1933 double eagle taken on Kodak film around 1980, I guess. H how well known in the numismatic community uh, was it that Nasker uh, may have owned these coins? And uh, do you have any idea what happened to them? I have no idea what happened to them. The, the information which was alluded to in my book, it, it was information that was later, you know, uh, in uh, a deposition, this was after Ted Nasker uh, passed away, uh, that said that he had four, that he had sold one off, this was the coin that, the mystery coin, as I call it, um, and that according to the deposition, the other ones were, and I quote, one on. Um, the one that he sold off was the one that was part of his, because he had a great collection of uh, double eagles, St. Gordon's double eagles in particular, um, to Jeff Browning in Dallas. And sale that was handled by William Higman's, uh, Stanley Kesselman, and Mike Brownlee. Um, and it went down to Browning, and he bought it in, I think, 1975, thereabouts. And he died three years later, I think it was. And when he died, I guess the estate must have been made aware of the cloud that hangs over 1933 double eagles. And Mike Brownlee uh, to take it off their hands, basically, take the headache off the hands. Um, and the coin was showed around the trade in the late 70s. Um, I know, for example, Fred uh, Weinberg um, saw it at about that time, as did uh, Ken Goldman. Um, and, you know, they all just sort of looked at it with their eyes agog. It was a coin that uh, Ken Goldman said to me, he said, here's a coin you can't even tell your mother about, is what Brownlee said to him. And then one particular people was interested in it and had the photographs taken. Uh, but then their counsel told them that it might not be the most possible thing to do. And at that point, Brown found somebody to purchase it and um, 
both at once. But I, in, in, you know, people in my generation did, didn't know it was a wrap, uh, and then it disappeared. And, and, you know, quite honestly, when Sotheby's and Stag sold the, in 2002, the only question about it, Baruch's, in fact, uh, were from a number of one back, you know, 30 odd years earlier, I'm wondering whether it wasn't the same one. Well, you know, at that time it was hard to tell, but once you looked at the photograph, you know, it didn't have the same pattern of flaws or die scratches, or not die scratches, but just plain scratches. And so it was clear they were not one in the same coin. You know, why, Stuart Weitzman must have as impeccable timing of any collector I've ever seen. I mean, he must be have the, the same talent for timing as he has with business and fashion uh, because he couldn't have picked a better time to put a coin like this up for sale uh, as we have probably the, the widest, hottest rare coin market, especially for the high end that we've had in probably 10, 15 years. Of course, you know, with uh, COVID uh, sort of turning the industry more into a virtual industry, which is, the continuation of what's been going on in the last few years to begin with. Mo most high roller bidders are buying bidding in their uh, pajamas uh, from their own homes as opposed to coming into the, the showroom. Uh, how, how do you see this, uh, this sale? Do you think this 2002 sale is like a magical moment and a place in time never to be recreated? Or do you think a little bit of that magic is going gonna, is gonna to show up here at this uh, 2021 offering, where I expect this coin to again retain or take its uh, position as the most valuable coin in all of American numismatics, um, I think you know it, it will be different. Uh, the coin still has the magic that hasn't left, and and and, and funny thing is, in many ways, uh, I think magic is enhanced. I will fine. I wrote I wrote a book, but I'm not the only one. There was Alison Frankel's book, which was also nonfiction. Uh, Linda Fairstein wrote a New York Times bestseller called The Kills, uh, which had the 1933 as a protagonist. Um, there's a book called The Double Eagle by James Twining, which is a thriller all about 1933 double eagles. Uh, the Closer on TV, NCIS LA, has all given 1933 double eagles a guest shot. It's had a, a documentary made about it. There was a, a tour in Europe of one of the Smithsonian examples. It's, it's, it's sort of maturing into a superstar from having been starlight. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I think the, 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 the buzz is there, the sense is there. To me, it's a great ambassador for our world. You know, when, when I get something is worthy of the New York Times article, just the, the announcement of it. When when you get sort of worldwide press coverage on something like this, it makes people who are not normally collectors focus on something that the three of us here are, are passionate about. And and I think that's a wonderful thing. I think when the 33 was sold back in, in 2002, it was kind of the tide coming in and raising all the boats. Because if you look at it, the coin market really took off again there. Um, and, and I like, I, you know, the fact that it's the only one, it's the great white whale. Um, I think, I think in my mind, and, you know, anybody can say, and, and probably with some truth, uh, I'm biased. I've spent a good deal of my time looking at this coin. Um, it's fascinating. And, and it's got, you know, it's beautiful. It's beautifully preserved. It was meant to be spent. It's a real coin. It's not a, it's not a specimen. It's not, it was just meant to be a workhorse coin. And it's historically as important a coin as you're ever going to find. Because not only does it mark America's last cult coin, but it really, it's the end of the gold standard. And it's, it's all there in one little package. So, yeah, I think just as compelling a thing for people to own if they've got, you know, a a few million dollars in loose change. Well, the sale of the coin will go down uh, in June. I think June, uh, June 8th, right? June 8th. June 8th, 10 o'clock, uh, with, with a couple of stamps. I look a couple of um, very important stamps. Uh, uh, we will, we, 
yeah, we will we will link uh, the the lot description for the 1933 double eagle. It'll be on offer at Sotheby's uh, in and the just description. So you know, uh, Charles, the as we speak, the online version of the catalog is going live today. I see that. I'm I'm actually on the page right now. Oh, yeah, so so a, a three a three lot auction, two of the most important stamps you'll you'll ever encounter, and one of the most important coins and all of numismatics will be sold on June eighth. I highly recommend uh any uh, coin collector uh who is so interested to check out David's tremendous catalog writing. Uh this is uh, you would think a three lot sale would be easy peasy, uh, but uh, David's uh, work is voluminous, insightful, in depth, and has over 90 footnotes. So this is a coin that is researched more than any coin probably in all of numismatics with actual documentary evidence. This isn't forensic science and uh, in guessing and, uh, and, uh, and hagography. This is the facts about one of the most notorious coins ever unintentionally released. Uh, David, thank you so much for coming on our podcast. A pleasure indeed. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Remember, you can download every episode of the Coin Week podcast for free on the iTunes Store. Stream it online on our YouTube channel or on CoinWeek.com. For Coin Week, I'm editor Charles Morgan. Until next time, happy collecting. <laughs>